There's a plethora mm -hmm. of assets, which is lovely. Uh, since you asked about them, <clears throat> I was a noted uranium bull. Then when the uranium price, and in particular the junior uranium uh, equities, pardon the pun, exploded, I became a uranium skeptic, and I'm on the way to becoming a uranium bull again. Mm -hmm. uh, the basket of junior equities in the uranium space is off by, what, 30 35%, certainly headed in the right direction. The increase in the price of yellow cake has moderated, uh, but I believe 2022 will see uh, the pace of Japanese nuclear restarts uh, come online, which will take care of the uranium price. So I think particularly if the uranium juniors continue to fall, if the hot money, the dumb money leaves them, uh, I think there's going to be a wonderful position to a wonderful opportunity to reestablish positions in the uranium space. I think it'll take probably two years, uh, two and a half years to reap the rewards finally. So somebody's going to have to deal with a lot of volatility and a lot of pain. Uh, in the interim, but I intend to establish or rather reestablish very meaningful positions in the uranium sector this year, mm -hmm. including in the material itself uh, through the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I love reading the comment on social media uh, uh, about the recent uranium bulls all of a sudden hating uranium. There's nothing in the world like a jilted lover uh, to uh, ignore the aspects of the narrative that caused them to be attracted to the narrative when it was overpriced. It just amazes me that when people buy financial assets, they'd rather pay more for them than pay less. But that being the case, uh, it's a wonderful set of circumstances. So I expect as the uranium equities prices fall to establish meaningful positions in uranium equities, particularly in the uranium equities that played chicken with capital markets last year and forgot to finance. I think now that the sector's out of favor, when they have to finance, they'll come into the market in private placements, and they'll have to give me a warrant, which is the only reason why I might participate in a private placement, to be honest with you. So I'm attracted to uranium. Uh, I'm attracted for every single investor, uh, the speculator, the income investor, uh, the growth investor. I'm attracted to the oil and gas sector. Uh, the oil and gas equities, particularly in your country, in Canada, the mid-cap oil and gas equities are priced as though we were in a $45 or $50 US WT market, or more particularly that we were in a $2.50 US uh, net gas, ECO market. Uh, and the markets that the producer's enjoying right now are closer to 70 than to 50. Uh, mm -hmm. And even Canadian natural gas has found a bid. If you look at the share prices that you're seeing in the oil sector relative to the cash flow that these companies are generating, they're truly spectacular. Meanwhile, the cost of capital to the oil and gas space has gone up, which means that many companies are deferring sustaining capital investments, which means that supply constraints will continue. This is the best of all possible worlds for people who invest in well-run oil and gas companies who maintain sustaining capital investments, who uh, you know can continue to drill uh, their high-quality uh, inventory into into supply shortages, who generate spectacular free cash and increasingly are willing to distribute some of that free cash by way of dividends to their owners. Uh, this is as good a climate in the oil and gas business uh, as I have seen in my career since the early part of the 1990s when literally nobody cared about the oil and gas. And I say this all the way from the Canadian names, the sort of Birch Cliffs and Patos of the world, uh, all the way up to ExxonMobil. Uh, I think it's a wonderful time to be in the oil and gas business. I think you need to pick and choose because there's still an awful lot of oil companies, but it's difficult for me to find a time when net present value uh, has been available in the enterprise values that are available today in the space. And then finally, you mentioned precious metals. It's difficult to me to, uh, figure out a situation that doesn't put us uh, squarely at the end of a first half of a precious metals bull market, uh, where typically 
you find a malaise or a decline. Uh, and the second half of a bull market. Uh, I, I say that not so much because of charts. Uh, I say it rather because precious metals traditionally have moved up in price when people are concerned about the purchasing power of their savings and conventional assets. And when I look at currencies, uh, either the US dollar or the Canuck buck, but really looking broader when I look at currencies around the world and I look at bonds or savings products denominated in those currencies, uh, there's no way that your savings keep pace with inflation. The challenges are uh, in order, and I want your listeners to write these down. The uh, challenges include, uh, include quantitative easing, uh, which is a very fancy Trudeau or Biden phrase for counterfeiting. That's all mm -hmm. it is. Uh, debt and deficits. Uh, these debts at, at the federal level in Canada and the United States will never be repaid. They have to be rolled over. The most pernicious, of course, is negative real interest rates. Uh, if you're a U.S. saver in the benchmark instrument, the U.S. 10-year treasury, the government pays you 1.5% in a currency that's declining in value by 6.5% a year. The government guarantees that you'll lose 5% a year in purchasing power. Uh, so obviously, people have reason to be concerned about the purchasing power of their savings in conventional instruments. Uh, and this means, uh, in my experience, almost certainly that eventually, it doesn't have to happen next month or the month after, but eventually this is a when question. Mm -hmm. This is certainly a when question. I think I've mentioned on your show before, Tom, but let me do it again. The market share of gold and silver is another reason why I think they don't go higher. They go much higher. Over the last four decades, precious metals and precious metals related assets have comprised uh, between one and a half and two percent of total savings and investment assets in the US market, which is to say their market share relative to other financial instruments has been between one and a half and two percent. Today, they're at one half of one percent. So, uh, it isn't to say that the market share of precious metals needs to reclaim their old 1980 high. All they need to do is revert to mean. And if they revert to mean, which I believe they're going to do, demand will triple or quadruple in the largest savings and investment market in the world. I see that happening. I see, uh, in particular, in the mid-cap gold space, the high-quality mid-cap gold space, companies where their net present value, I define net present value as the, the current value, discounted value of future cash flows from proven developable reserves and resources at current prices. I see net present values relative to enterprise value, enterprise value being market cap and debt minus cash at the most attractive levels that I've seen, seen them in 45 years in the business. Uh, but I believe the gold prices are going higher, <laughs> which means even at current gold prices, relative to historic norms, they're cheap. But I see the precious metals prices going higher. So I would say I'm bullish across the commodity spectrum. The difference between me and many of your viewers is that despite the fact that I'm 68, crowding 69 very hard, uh, as I have less time on earth, I become more patient. It's mm -hmm. odd that younger people seem to have trauma holding an investment over a long weekend. Uh, and an older person such as myself, understanding the underlying arithmetic becomes very patient. But I'm very patient and I'm very, very, very bullish.